three, two. Good evening. I now call to order the May 11th meeting in the Budget Committee of the Board of Education in Baltimore County. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion is applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Slade if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Slade, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Mr. Kuhn. Here. Ms. Causey. Here. Ms. Hen. Here. Ms. Mack. Here. Mr. McMillian. Here. Thank you. Ms. Slade, Ms. Slade please call the roll of the staff members participating in today's meeting. Mr. Hartlove. Here. Mr. Tantliff. Present. If there are additional staff participating that were not mentioned, please state your name. Hi, this is Pedro Augusto. Thank you. Anyone else? OK, thank you. Well, welcome to the May Budget Committee meeting. I uh, appreciate everybody's time. I know it's a beautiful evening and we have many other things we possibly prefer to do. Uh, so I'm going to get right into um, the heart of the matter. Um, so the first item in new business is the County Executive's FY 2023 proposed budget and related ESSER grant funding. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Tantliff to share and go over the document that he's provided in board docs to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Um, <clears throat> we briefly went through uh, this document last month, so I'm going to uh, go through it again, um, entertain any questions from the board. Um, Mr. Gusto is here to talk about some of the uh, IT support issues uh, Mr. Kuhn was curious about. Um, and then um, we have items that are in ESSER that could potentially be looked at as having a funding cliff sometime in the future, just for discussion purposes. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll go through this roll up again and feel free to stop me if you'd like at any point. Uh, and I hope it's not repetitive, but we, we did it pretty quickly last month and you know, it's the star of the show today. Uh, thanks, Mr. Tantliff. And just very quickly for everybody, um, we have seen this this information before. We've seen both the ESSER funding um, uh, that that's laid out, and also um, very quickly the uh, county executive's proposed budget versus uh, what the board had approved. Uh, I asked him to highlight things here specifically associated uh, with ESSER funding. So for instance, you'll see the elementary school IEP chairs, and that's highlighted in that whatever color you want to call it. I'll, I'll call it light orange. Um, and you can see that the county executive proposed $0 for that, but ESSER funding is picking it up to the tune of $6.3 million. And the point, of, the point of this exercise is to show that these, these items are not being budgeted from the county and once the ESSER funds go away that there will be an unmet need or there will be some action that needs to be taken by the board uh, and in conjunction with the, our funding partner the county to to handle these items. So sorry Mr. Tantliff, hopefully I'm not stealing sure. too much of your thunder but I, nope. I just wanted to point out what we're what we're looking at and why we're looking at it tonight. Sure, thank you. 
<clears throat> so I'm going to go through each line item on here. And like I said, if you uh, if we want deeper discussion on any, please feel free to uh, raise your hand or chime in. <clears throat> so the first thing uh, was we had proposed to increase the. Uh, oh, and just uh, again to refresh everyone's memory, just to fit everything on the screen, this is the CE's budget. And then over here is just the difference from the board proposed budget. So uh, if I had this whole thing open, you'd see over here the C the um, board's proposed budget itself, but I don't think that's necessary. So in any case, um, the per pupil increase in funding uh, was removed. The new Northeast Elementary School, the 23.8 positions are not regular teachers, but they're things like specials, some um, special ed positions, uh, custodians, uh, so it's non teaching positions that go with a new school. So we will need to uh, fund those through uh, the kind of pool of extra positions that position management um, holds centrally to uh, fill in that reduction of 11 positions. Watershed, uh, just a small increase based on their uh, enrollment projected changes that gets trued up. Uh, special ed had a significant decrease versus what was proposed. So only 22 positions are in, 114 are out. Um, the IEP chairs, which is a reminder, are actually in the ESSER grant in FY22. Um, they will be in the ESSER grant again in FY23, and we'll look at that um, once we're done going through the CE's budget. Mr. Tantliff, yes. uh, Ms. Mack has a question about the special education program funding. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for this, Mr. Tantliff. I was trying to work with this today, and in the superintendent's budget presentation, he had 210.5 special education positions. I see 22 in line four under the special education programs that were approved by the county executive. I see um, 75 in line five, but as we just discussed, they are going to be funded by ESSER, not by the county executive. Can you tell me where I can find the difference between the 210.5 and the 97 that we've talked about thus far? Um, no, but when we uh, get a break, I can look. I, I don't know everything that was in there off the top of my head because it's been a little while. Uh, and then a, 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 this may, might be part of the answer, but maybe not. Where we see assistant principals and support staff, are those separate assistant principals from the assistant principals that I'm sorry, are they totally separate no. from special education? Um, Ms. Mack, uh, before I answer that, so if you add, you add 22 plus 114 plus 75, the 75 were proposed in the budget. So I, those are the three components that come out to the total in the superintendent's proposed budget for special ed. It didn't get funded, but it was in his budget and in your budget for it to be funded by the general fund. OK, so then just to be clear, um, the 22 were funded in the county executives proposed. Uh -huh. The 114 were not. Yes. And then um, what was the other number, Mr. The Taylor? 75 IEP chairs also were not. So if you add up those three numbers, that was the total special ed ask. So the but because of ESSER funds, the real delta. Even though that creates a cliff, the real delta is the 114. Yes, that's correct. OK, thank you. Uh, and the the APs and support staff are not related to special education. Those are just larger schools uh, where we need to put in a few either secretarial positions or APs. Okay, Mr. Thank you. I, I just have a quick follow on sure. uh, associated with the special education program line item. So I'm, I'm making an assumption and I just want to check that assumption with you. So in essence, there are 22 that are funded, 114 that are not funded, but those are all the same job classification or type, correct? Like No, there's a variety of different types of special positions under the special ed umbrella. There's some teachers, there's some paras. 
So services. can we tell what is funded and what isn't here? Because it's to see yes. th this is kind of part of the definition that's missing from some of these items. Um, yes, I'm going to need to open another file while we're talking for that. Okay. Though. All right, great. So I'll can we pop back to that one. Unless you want me to look, I'll look right now. Hold on. Give me a second. And just to be clear, unless there's um, some type of item like funded by ESSER, um, the assumption is that there is no funding whatsoever for the things that the county executive has not proposed in his budget, correct? Uh, that's Jen, yes. Uh, but there, you'll see there's a couple items on here. The superintendent is trying to see if he can move things around. Uh, things, you know, to come up with a solution. For instance, the magnet programs. Those were existing this year. They were on uh, the magnet grant. Uh, and we don't want to either A, reduce everyone's per pupil or pull back on those programs. So we're seeing if there's some uh, funds available to plug in there um, to keep all those, keep everything and keep the per pupil intact. Okay. Mr. Kuhn. Uh, yes. Ms. Hen. Ms. Hen. Yes, Hi. I just have a general question while we're we're on the topic then. Um, to Mr. Tantlow's point about the superintendent being able to shift things around to cover line items that were not funded um, by either the county appropriation or by ESSER. And that is um, what are there any limits? to his authority to be able to do so in terms of that? And this is a question for Mr. Tantliff. Or is he free to, as long as he sticks within the, the appropriation, um, transfer as he deems appropriate? As a follow-up, um, what is the board's role in that? Well, if we don't approve modified budget. Well, um, that might require a budget line transfer, which the budget committee would see following the first quarter. Um, and if it didn't change activities, um, then it would be within the appropriation authority, which is by activity. But we're not talking about much money for the magnet here that we're trying to plug in to keep the per pupil intact. So there, you know, there are some funds that we may be able to pull that don't have any impact on operations, but we no decisions have been made on that. Okay. And, and Mr. Tantliff, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we also have the position count overall position FTE amount that we have to stay within. So if we were to do anything on positions, it would be using existing, it would be like reclassifications of existing positions. So it's 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 pretty limited in what the superintendent can do um, because he's where he's 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 uh, is kind of capped on FTE and he's um, and then within the categories he's he's capped there as well. So so there, there's not and then those items would be coming through. There would be no FTE overall changes and the and the other changes would be coming through uh, um, a BLT. Or BAT. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. It was the FTEs. I knew there was another um, restriction on it, and so he is restricted on FTEs, and that's regardless of the position type. It's just a a straight count of FTEs. Is that correct? Yes, we can cannot. The superintendent cannot create an FTE from scratch, but he can. Well, so, or in other words, re repurpose. Yes, he can. Ms. Okay. Causey, you have a question. Go ahead. Ms. Causey, did in, in, oh, I'm, in the I'm chat. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Kuhn. 
Yeah, I'm Chris Hartlove. I'm the uh, chief financial officer for the school system. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn, and thank you, Mr. Hartlove and Mr. Tantleff for this um, presentation and discussion. I had a quick question going back to the um, new school where there were, I believe it was 12 positions not being funded. Yes. For the new school, thank you. Um, are those positions typical of other elementary schools in the county? Yes, the positions will need to be put in the school. Uh, position management and human resources always has some uh, positions that have been held back to take into account enrollment adjustments and emergency situations once we go back to school. So the positions will need to come out of there. It's a standard okay. opening. It's a standard package for an elementary school. OK, thank you. Um, so in order to be equitable, it um, the superintendent and the board should find a way to provide these personnel to this new school. Uh, Is that a fair position statement? Ma position management will put the p required positions in the school. OK, thank you. And what enrollment projection is this budget based on? And can you clarify if the actual enrollment decreases? What, if any, impact will be on the county's contribution? And if the enrollment increases from the projection, um, what impact would that have on the county contribution? Um, the county, uh, as a refresher, all funding from the state and the county is one year in arrears. This year's FY22, September 30th enrollment, so September 30th, 2021, determines 100% of our revenue for next year, and that is regardless of how many students show up on the first day of school. So that is locked and loaded, so to speak. Um, and they did, uh, it, it doesn't affect how much the county's funding, but they did, they have changed the definition of maintenance of effort the last couple of years because of declining enrollment. We based uh, the budget on the projected enrollment, but um, of course, there's more uncertainty this year than we've had in the past. You know, you see see what happened in September 22, but we're confident there's enough um, positions budgeted to keep all the budgeted ratios, particularly because the VLP program will have 3,000 students um, and we are not reducing our teacher count uh, to take that into account. So in other words, the 200 or so positions in VLP are all incremental to the general fund budget. So um, I, I think anyone would agree there's definite uncertainty. I think we're projecting to go up by 4,000 kids next year, back up to about 115,000. But um, that, you know, maybe an undercount, maybe an overcount. There's just a lot of uncertainty out there on that topic. Thank you. And so what was the September 30, 2021 enrollment number? Uh, 111, one, I, I can get it. I, I haven't memorized it. I can uh, get it quickly if you'd like it. Thank you. And I'll hold any further questions until okay. after the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Mr. Kuhn, did you still want the special ed positions that are cut? Could you do that? I, I yeah. Is there somewhere, is this is this information and in the detail associated with what decisions the county executive made? Is that available to, uh, to the board? I mean, I haven't seen a, a breakdown and that's why I asked the question. Yeah, well, um, let me see. The county exec staff um, asks for a lot of details uh, behind the budget. So they're very aware of all of the work that we're doing and we answer. We're very transparent and we answer any questions they may have. So here on special ed, for instance, this is the line items that feed the roll up. So you can see here the occupational therapist stayed in, the physical therapist, let me see if you can get the count, is one, is out the three speech 
uh, language pathologists are out, the four special ed teachers are out. Um, this they left in the um, uh, six birth to five uh, and infants and toddler positions. Uh, they lost the clericals that they requested for special ed, two occupational therapists, down two PTs, down five speech language pathologists. Uh, the paras um, remain. So we That's have 15 right. paras. 15 to 6. And yep. Yep, and then one. we lost 27.5 on this line. So you can see that's kind of the makeup of it. OK, well, thank you for that. And this These is a didn't make it, though. So there was two different chunks of Paris. Okay. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, it, this this is enriching our understanding of what happens now. Part of the my 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 real question is why, <laughs> you know, why was this stricken and this stricken and not that? For instance, I don't understand why the county executive would not fund the staff for a new elementary school. That kind of boggles and blows my mind at the same time because it's coming online and it needs to be fully staffed. And I understand that we'll get there right with personnel that we have within the system or our ability right to kind of shift. But it just doesn't make sense unless he knows we have this overhang and that he could just kind of not worry about those those 11 positions because he knows BCPS is going to step in and and they have to fill it so they'll do it somehow. I, I believe that was probably his understanding, but obviously I wasn't in um, those conversations. But I think because of the ESSER grant, because of the uncertainty on enrollment, um, um, he probably, now he may or may not have had a full understanding of which positions he was reducing by because you don't know the dynamics over there of what the conversations are about, but I'm sure in his mind he wasn't saying don't fully staff the new school. He probably just felt like we had enough flexibility to find positions. Okay, well, it's a vastly different narrative than looking at the spreadsheet and saying, well, he didn't fund the positions for the brand new school. Right? Yeah. So, sure. you know, because uh, it could be, it could be very, very much, it could be interpreted that way. All right. So, uh, Mr. Malian, you have a question? Yeah, Mr. Tantlev, just real quickly. Uh, have you met this? It, it, would you call this a committee that works with the county executive or the people that have other responsibilities at other times of the year? I'm just curious about this group of people. Are, are, is, well, you know, have I you know. met them? Are there eight or 10 or 12 people? And they must be. I like how you're smiling. <laughs> I don't think there's some some shady group, you know. No, no, I'm not. Those. I'm just curious about their and you, you know, I'm not asking for names or anything, but I'm just curious. No, because Mr. they must they must have really extensive backgrounds in public education to be able to 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 analyze this uh, the superintendent's budget and pick it apart to the point that they think that you know such and such is not valuable and, and versus something else so i'm just curious about their backgrounds and and well, have you go okay, ahead I'm so sorry. so uh the the process basically works like this there is an analyst in the CE's office whose uh, purview is the school budget. She may have some other things too, but this is her main accountability, especially during budget season. So she's analyzing the budget and asks lots of questions. Uh, she's excellent and she's been through a few budget cycles, so she's familiar with the budget. She's feeding information to, I don't know their decision making, people or process, but Ed Blades is the director of finance for the county. So I'm sure just like the superintendents uh, going through each of the chief's uh, proposals, the county executive, there's layers of um, screening to go through each um, agency that's in the county's budget. They have to figure out how much money they have, how much can go to the schools. Once they've decided how much money can go to the schools, 
they start making decisions with uh, whatever their process would be, which can include calling up the superintendent and getting his feedback. I, I don't know um, how much that occurred. Um, and then the superintendent presented his budget to the county executive before it was finalized. So uh, that's what the county executive and his team. And so there was lots of back and forth there. Uh, Chris and Chris Hartlove and I were there. Uh, we answered any questions they have. We talked about our priorities. Um, and so after that whole process, uh, you know, they went in and made cuts where they needed. They might have added some things. They added a couple of small things to our budget. And then the budget is final. So, I mean, that's it in a nutshell. OK, thank, thank you very much. Sure. Um, going, is there another question or we're going? Mr. Kuhn, I had a quick question. Go ahead, please. Just to wrap this up. Um, so, Mr. Tantliff, I asked this in the last meeting, and I think I finally have the number correct. So, of the 381 FTEs that the superintendent requested, when all was said and done in the um, CE's proposed budget, there's 160.8, so a deficit of 220.5. Um, is that correct? Well, if you, are you looking at the total FY 2023 general fund request? It's a I blue am. line on the next page. You oh, see 133.8 people funded and 261 and a half people not funded. Is that accurate, Mr. Tanaleff? Is that so the how we should the Yeah. So here's the 395 the board proposed. And the CE did 133.8, which was down by 261.5. I'm um, saying that last. OK, right. OK, and I guess I don't know if you know this, Mr. Tantliff, um, if the answer to this, but the board made a motion to for whatever happened with this budget to prioritize people and pay for those people in this budget cycle. Do you know if that was taken into consideration at all? Uh, I know 100% that the presentation to the county executives had your exact words um, as part of our position. How he processed that, I, you would need to speak to him. But he, we conveyed that that was uh, absolutely where the board stood. Thank you very much. Thank sure. you, Mr. Um, Kuhn. We actually put it on a page. That's good to hear. Thank you. Yes, of course. So I think we've made it to the fifth line. OK, I could, uh, you know, go at any speed. I'm, I'm no, I, I appreciate it. Um, okay. Ms. Ms. Ann, do you have a comment or a question? I do. I have a quick question um, procedural. And this, this may be a question for our, our funding partners, but um, with regards to process, I know that the county council um, now approves the budget after the county executive um, has finalized his take on it and they can not add to the budget, but they can cut. Do we know whether or not they can reallocate line items? For instance, to Ms. Mack's point, the board has prioritized people and pay. Could the council then um, take action to reallocate according to that priority as well? Uh, what I believe, Ms. Hen, is since they can only cut and not add, that that applies to all individual line items. So moving it from point A to point B would be cutting and then adding. I don't think they can do the add part. So I don't okay. believe they can reallocate. Thank you, Mr. Chantler. That answers my question. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. OK, uh, the magnet program didn't get funded. I actually uh, mentioned uh, we were looking to see how much of the 967 we can find, and it might just be from other areas within CNI's budget. Um, there's some other uh, small buckets we may have available, um, but that has not been presented to the superintendent yet. But I, I know. Um, I think Mr. Hartlove will in the coming weeks uh, has a discussion with that with the Dr. Williams and his staff. 
Um, the English Learner Program survived intact, as did the APs and the secretaries. The staff development teachers got cut. Um, the Maryland Leeds uh, match that the board put in did not survive, uh, nor did the alternative school enhancement that the board put in. Uh, special ed placements, this is just a built in cost. Uh, so it's really just our inflationary costs was left in for non public placement and for parent reimbursement. Uh, $6 million you know about as our contractual uh, reductions in our PC costs, in addition to converting the high schools to Chromebook, we're saving, uh, continuing our path of saving money. Um, college and Career Ready, or CCR, is a new component of Blueprint. So we got the details on this funding after the superintendent proposed his budget. So we added the 1.8 in, and the money will have a specific use. So the county added in matching expenditures. Um, it's not fully planned out yet, so it's just in a holding place in the correct area. Uh, but that was uh, a wash. And the same thing with pre-K. Um, this is mainly dealing with we're going to have to pay eligible private providers next year um, as defined by the state. So if they have those kids, there's, mm, I forget the exact number, a little under 200 that the state has identified that meet all the criteria to get uh, reimbursement for tuition. Uh, and there's, I think, some questions still on how it'll be handled, but right now they put it in our budget and we'll have to have a process to pay for that. So that was also added to the budget and it wasn't there originally, but there was revenue to match it. And then there's Mr. a- Mr. Tantliff, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. No. The college and career ready expense, what is that line item? That has to do with um, students that are, this is um, a component of the blueprint legislation that is enhancing the experience for students that are already career and college ready. So the dollars would go and it could pay for things to do with AP exams. It could be uh, expanded CCBC tuition reimbursement. You know, right now they can do four classes. I'm just making up things. They're they're working on the plan, but you could go to six classes or seven classes for those uh, students. But I think everyone's working through the rules right now and where the dollars need to go. But that is not to get kids career and college ready. That is to enhance the experience of children who are defined already as career and college ready. At least the dollars are supposed to go to that school where those students reside. And when I see 1.8 million, I see the exact numbers in both the budget, the county executive, and the increase versus board proposed. Is that is that because these items were not part of what came through us? It's Correct. It's actually a new ad, right? Yeah. So we don't change any revenue, even if we so we we got a preliminary revenue estimate from the state in late January, but we can't change the budget that the superintendent proposed. So uh, we have the county true up revenue um, with the final allocation from the state. Now you know there's a lot more uncertainty now because blueprint and the formulas are new and how much they're worth. So this grant was completely new this year and we didn't have an amount for it, so we didn't include it in the budget initially. So the, since we know about it now, the CE added the 1.8 million of revenue and the 1.8 million of expense. All right, thank you. Sure, same thing with pre-K. Uh, and then the Judy Center expansion, I'm not uh, completely conversant in it, but there was a new grant available. And if you could match, it, uh, dollar for dollar, you had a much higher probability of getting this enhanced Judy Center grant. So the CE funded our match. Um, so the grant itself, when it comes through, should be another 240,000 to expand um, the Judy Center opportunities. So before we move on, um, the Maryland Leeds grant matching funds, 
so I don't know the details about this grant, but my understanding is when I see matching is that if we don't come up with the money or the county doesn't come up with the money, then it doesn't get matched by whoever's providing the grant. Is that accurate? That's it's a portion of the grant there. So there's an there's a kicker you can get if you can match it. Um, but you can you we can use, for instance, ESSER funds as our match. Um, and it doesn't have to happen in 23. It can happen in 24. So uh, but I believe the application has gone in now. Um, and I believe, uh, and I maybe don't quote me on this, uh, maybe Chris knows, but um, the kicker will be a follow up once we get the other parts of the program going. So I think they're confident that if we have the ability to spend the money, we can find the matching funds either through an amendment to the ESSER grant, which uh, we'll be doing in the future, or requesting it in FY24 as a, for a superintendent request. So I think the CE felt like it was not critical to fund that this year because there's other options out there to meet to meet this requirement. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, now, safe and supportive environment, the CE funded most of the positions except for the extra health services, but he did the extra counselors, extra social workers. Um, so they did, you know, 56 positions is pretty significant in this area. Um, uh, the next is high performing workforce and human capital. So for the employee incentives and restructuring, we had proposed restructuring for each of, uh, to some extent, each of the bargaining units wage scale and the only one that was approved. And it wasn't um, where uh, we had hoped to be, but it was where we kind of started the discussion. But AFSCME did receive some enhancement um, and the other bargaining units did not. Everyone got funded a step on July 1st or whenever that employee is eligible. A number of teachers aren't eligible till February based on their hiring date, but most are July 1st. Uh, the COLA, we had proposed a July 1st 4% COLA. The CE funded for us 3% on January 1st, which I believe matches what um, the county employees received. And uh, Ms. Mack said she has a question. Go ahead, Ms. Mack. I do. Um, I do have a question about the 3% COLA in January as opposed to July. Is that final? Are, are there no further negotiations? Um, are, is there any Hail Mary thing that's going to happen to give yeah. teachers and educators the COLA um, in July as opposed to January? Um, I, I can say the unions have not agreed to the CE's proposal yet. Uh, so where that goes or where it ends up or could the CE somehow fund more money or could something be done? I can't uh, speak to that, but I, I do know that they have not signed the new agreements yet. Do we have the flexibility within our budget within BCPS to move money around to make that happen? Uh, the dollar amounts, you know, are are many, many millions of dollars to do that. So the normal answer would be no, unless uh, the superintendent wanted to do pretty draconian cuts to the program as soon as the school year starts. Uh, but that is not likely. So I can't answer um, whether that can be addressed or not. I can tell you it'd be very difficult to do within our existing resources. You know, using ESSER for a bonus like we did in FY22, you know, I think that's probably, um, you know, something that would be more easily funded. So procedurally, Mr. Tantliff, you said that the unions have not signed off on this budget. Is that a requirement of this budget or is it a, just uh, a not, process? No, it's not a requirement of the budget. The budget's putting a certain amount of dollars to fund 
the bargaining agreements, uh, the unions have different avenues they can go down if they don't agree with it. There's a, a number of legal procedures that they could go through, which could end up, if it got to that, at arbitration, you know, where anything could happen. And if you lost arbitration and they said we need to produce more money, um, I'm not sure how that would be handled, but there's different resolution points that labor relations could speak to in uh, more detail. But first, you try to have a mediation hearing to come to an agreement. We did that for um, ESPBC, the paras and secretaries, and TABCO last year. So they didn't agree at first. We were able to do some small things and come to an agreement. Um, but that would uh, be outside of the the dates that are already set for the budget process. It doesn't. If the budget process itself is this will this is to determine how much money is in our budget to pay for certain things. That's ideally would be exactly matching what the bargaining agreements come out to. Um, but no matter what position the unions take, that would not affect the council's ability to adopt the budget. Okay, thank you again. Mr. Tantliff, quick question for you. So um, I see that, um, and, and Ms. Causey had asked a question, so I'm, I think I'm gonna answer it here. The cost of living adjustment, right? You said this $24 million in essence is a 3% increase starting in January. And that's, that's $27.7 million less than what was requested. That's accurate, correct? Yes. So in essence, the 3% increase started starts in January, and it looks like we may have asked for a little more than that, and so we're basically we getting to, half of it. We had to cover the 2% carryover because that didn't start till January also, and that was about $8 million that because it wasn't in our baseline budget. So, okay. so that's, um, that's the extra money there. Yes, if yes, yes, yes. And the employee incentives and restructuring. So just the one union asked me was affected there. Everything else was denied on our ability to make any kind of changes. Does this in any way feed into the restructuring of the pay scale for teachers that we're trying to do that through the, you know, the blueprint wants us to kind of narrow it, increase it, but also kind of make it simpler going forward is that that doesn't have anything to do with that. That yes, that line that, item, does it? Well, just yes. Yeah. So the teacher restructuring, which was presented to you, um, was rejected by the CE. So each bargaining unit had a different type of restructuring um, in the proposal, and that didn't get uh, agreed to either. Um, but just to clarify, that restructuring you saw was TABCO's proposal. We helped them with it to craft it and cost it out and model it. But that is not the blueprint requirement to, to you know, That's um, a, few, it down. a few years off, correct? Yeah, July 1st, 2026, FY27, a step one grade one teacher right out of college undergrad needs to be at, at least $60,000. That's the requirement and blueprint. There were some hurdles along the way, like you need to have had a 10% increase by next year, which we, we've achieved already. But that's the actual requirement. Tabco's position was they wanted to, over five years, reduce the number of steps so that a brand new teacher could max out in 25 years instead of 30 years. That was, you know, it in a nutshell. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, okay, extended day support helps with the extra 15 minutes. So this provides permanent uh, substitutes and lunchroom assistance to help fill in the day for the extra 15 minutes that the teachers get now because that's all planning time in the MOU. Uh, sub rates and miscellaneous pay rates, we went up to a $14 minimum wage basically. So that the people most affected, no, we increased the sub rate too, 
but AAs were at minimum wage, so they will all go to $14. That's the largest component of this. Uh, there was a small bucket to add um, steps for the chief. They get the COLA because all employees did, but their wage scale doesn't have a step. So uh, the superintendent needed to request that and that got rejected as well as a small adjustment to the director scale. Uh, mandatory minimum wage, so that had to happen. Uh, we just went, uh, uh, you all probably know, we just went to 1250. January 1st next year goes to 1325, and then uh, 14 and then 15. Uh, this is the Kelly Services proposal, and we're working with them right now uh, to figure out what can be done uh, since the CE did not fully fund this initiative, um, I'm part of that team and we believe um, they can still come up with a good program, but possibly the, the committed fill rate will be significantly higher than we're doing this year, but less than what would be the full proposal. Mr. Tantliff, uh, Ms. Mack has a question about Kelly Services. Okay. Mr. Tantliff, it looks like the CE funded six hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars for that, but I don't I need to understand what it's doing. Um, I mean, my understanding you, is when a school needs a sub, they have a pool of candidates. They pull from that list of candidates. What will this provide us with? Sure. So first, I'm not sure the number you're quoting, but he funded two million but we requested 3.4. You can see right here the 2 million highlighted. Oh, and Ms. Mack, I wanted to mention, uh, because this came up last month, the teacher certification was funded. I think I think you believed it was not funded. Yeah, I see that, that. thank you. Funded. So uh, just to clarify that. So and my, I, I did the math incorrectly, you're, you're right. Yeah, so you can just look right here. This is what he cut it by. But uh, in a nutshell, what Human Resources has proposed <clears throat> is to, have Kelly Services manage the entire substitute process. If it works perfectly, it will be invisible to the school. They're gonna use the same system they use now to hire subs. Kelly will hire all of our subs and pay them the rate that we're paying them now. And they will also offer uh, benefits. So we don't offer medical benefits to our subs. I believe they are going to. Um, and give them some vacation. So they'll be giving them some benefits. They'll do all the recruiting. They'll be responsible for placement. So um, our uh, group that manages substitutes will not be, they'll manage the relationship with Kelly. They'll need to verify the bill. I'm sure they'll help troubleshoot, troubleshoot especially at startup. But Kelly, uh, will take the place of human resources in that process. And their intent is every one of our subs now will move over to become a Kelly employee. And they they have do this in a lot of districts around the country. I don't know the number, but I know they took over Philadelphia a couple years ago. Um, and I believe they might do one county in Maryland. I forget which one, but um, this is not new to them and they've had uh, success. So it's something that HR pushed for and wanted to try and was one of their priorities. So uh, hopefully it'll go smooth as silk. <laughs> so is the two million for managing the process or does that include the pay that we would be paying this or they would be paying the subs that we previously paid the subs? No, the, basically think of this as their overhead cost. Um, the entire sub budget would move to the Kelly contract. So um, you'll you'll be seeing, I don't know when, but you'll see the Kelly contract come to the board and it won't only include this, but the salaries for all the subs will move to contractual services because Kelly will be paying them. But to us, Kelly is just a contract. So it'll be significant. It'll, I don't know exactly what the amount will end up being, but it'll be in the $20 million plus range because the entire sub budget will move into the contract plus this 2 million. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, 
cabinet restructuring everyone knows about. Those were the nine positions we removed related to the cabinet. Um, we moved the uh, what they call the TSI grant um, stayed intact, but we moved it to special revenue for next year. Um, the CE added right here. He didn't add, but there's uh, 6.8 million, which is a reduction in benefits. That's only this is directly tied to the positions. But um, what you can see, this is for additional positions. Uh, this line is existing employees. The majority of this is $5 million that we pay into our um, bucket that the county manages for retiree health benefits. They increased our requirement by $5 million. So that's most of what that increase is right there. And then um, uh, the CE also added um, EYE days. So think of it as per diem days for teachers so that Hereford Ag Program, which covers the middle and high school, could keep all their animals over the summer. So I guess they sent the animals back to the farm in the past. Now the animals will remain. And I think they're going to probably uh, try to have some educational component in the summer. Uh, I don't know all the particulars, but uh, between the, the uh, several- Mr. Tantliff, that's, that's $14,000 and whatever. Going on, I, moving on. I, I, I would like to go back to the $9 million that wasn't funded in the benefit costs to understand the impact because it sounds like benefits have to be paid. So are we short $9.1 million no, strictly, there? No, that automatically went down because our position count went down. Oh, so that's new positions. Not so the next line that went up by 7 million is for our existing employees health benefits. So we, we break out the line so you can clearly see it. And um, so we have auto calculations in here. So, you know, our positions dropped by two thirds. So obviously the fringe benefits we need for dropped accordingly. So everything is funded as far as benefits go. OK, and that that has to do with headcount. This is just uh, the CE cutting the number of new positions. All right, so the 240 positions or 241 positions that didn't get funded. Yes. That's the difference that $9 million in benefits has to do with that. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, let's try to finish up real quick here. The two uh, we did. He did actually partially uh, fund the coordinator of student activities. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Miss Miss Causey has two quick questions associated with Kelly's services, and I'm going to hold you to the quick part, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Two quick questions. One, did principals have any input into the Kelly services arrangement? Um, I understand that now <clears throat> with the software program or the program that's used, principals can send requests for substitutes and they can see lists of candidates and then select who they think is going to be the best fit. Uh, the next question is, there are um, several recommendations in public works regarding human resources recruitment. Um, and also, specifically because Mr. Augusto is on the call, uh, there were two public works recommendations about consolidating all of the human resource information system modules. And those are my two quick questions. Um, I do not believe there was a conversation with the schools, but HR would need to confirm that because I believe the intent is for it to be invisible for the schools. But actually, uh, the intent, I mean, from a system standpoint, because they're going to use the same system as now, but the intent is the fill rate is dramatically higher than this year. So it would strictly be a benefit to the principals, but it's the same again. The intent is for it to be the same substitutes. Kelly will do recruiting for new substitutes. So I believe anything the principals can do and request now, they'll be able to do and request next year. 
And what was, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Causey, what was the second part of the question? Do you mind repeating it? Certainly, Public Works in recommendation 2-8, which represents page 97 out of the 749 page report, it says BCPS should consolidate all human resource information system services and create an office of human resource technology services and reclassify the HR information technology system officer position to director with a suggested implementation date of October to December of 2021. So was that considered by our department of so, so information Ms. Causey, technology? Ms. Ms. Causey, I'm, I'm going to step in that we're kind of, we're veering away from the Kelly services question. Um, is is the expectation and and um, if <laughs> I'm not quite sure where to go with this without blowing up the meeting at this point. If there's a quick answer, that's fine. If it's a longer answer, we're not, we're not it may talking to about in a weekly but, update. Okay, I, I just want to make it clear we're not we're not talking about the audit. Um, if some of these items tied to it, uh, perhaps. Um, the CIO could adjust that, but I'm not quite sure if the Kelly Services substitute platform yeah. is is the way. So I'll, I'll allow. Mr. Kian, I'll I'll give a quick 10 second answer because I think uh, there'll be follow on questions that'll probably be best served with the weekly status update. Um, the answer is causing to your question is that. Uh, we're actually evaluating. Uh, so part of the the recommendation is uh, being taken into consideration, and that is evaluating uh, the HRS as a whole uh, with the intent of consolidating all the modules, having interoperability within the different functions, um, the hiring component, the screening component, and then ultimately, or sorry, the um, recruitment, and then ultimately moving into uh, the basic HR functions. So we're going through an alternatives analysis right now for the um, ERP systems that are out. So that is part of this. It's not necessarily tied to this budget. So if you have follow on questions, be happy to answer if you if you put those in. But just very quickly, that was an answer to at least part of what you were asking. I appreciate that answer and I look forward to uh, any additional updates in the weekly update. Thank you. All right, uh, let's bring it home. Uh, if we go down to operational excellence, actually the first several items, replacement lifts, vehicles, um, uh, contract bus, this is just inflation in the contract, um, all got funded. Uh, the facilities built to learn, staffing support, one of the four positions request, or uh, the CE proposed um, for positions versus the three so he actually went up by one but he didn't provide the preventative maintenance positions that were requested that's why that went down by nine um and the school support specialist got funded energy management software did not air purifier filters we uh will be able to move we believe to the s or three grant so that uh, should not be detrimental by not getting funded. Uh, the IT security software got funded. Um, the display panels did not, but we are purchasing 2.9 million this year. This was for leases, but we're purchasing 2.9 million this year. And then the technology support contractors, which were uh, proposed at 4.9 million, <clears throat> were not funded by the county executive. Do you have any comments on that, Mr. Kuhn? That I want? did. Thank you for pausing. Uh, Mr. Augusto, uh, the 4.9 million, like um, there, there was recently an expansion, in one of the contracts, like for $12 million for more support, right? Um, with a limited time horizon. So I'm curious how this plays into that request, if at all. Yes. So the request that that came across, that came through the board. So the, the 12 million actually incorporated two things. It was the um, continuation of the existing uh, extension of the contract that we had uh, for the current steady state level of technicians. The 4.9 that you see here 
um, was part of that request that was to increase the amount of field technicians uh, primarily to address um, or to increase our ability to meet a target of same day resolution for device uh, malfunctions, um, knowing that we've moved to um, more digital online um, uh, learning where, well, not the, the, the courses, but where it's very important for students to have those devices that being out of action for more than one day really um, impedes the ability to learn. So we wanted to increase staff to cover and allow us to do same day resolution of uh, incidents that go out in the field. So let me ask you a, a kind of a follow on. So that's not funded. So that's $5 million. So should we, can we take that as, right? You requested 12 million and this 5 million is no, no longer there. So we, we don't expect you to ever spend to the level that we actually approved. Is that accurate? Okay. Yes. Yes, right. And then follow on question, because um, a lot of this comes down to device malfunction and issue, correct? Mm -hmm. The support. And my understanding, hopefully, uh, it's your understanding and in, in the way that you're working is that you're going to have a level of replacement devices available in schools so that kids aren't stuck with a laptop that doesn't work for a number of days. They can just simply swap it out. Is that is that the plan? Yeah, so the the um, the plan for the Chromebook um, requests, spending story, and then the the um, the um, ultimate purchase of those devices includes a percentage for um, break fix. Now, um, a certain small amount will be housed at the schools, um, but there will be the ability for us to take uh, equipment that we have that comes in from the vendor and be able to take that, you know, drop ship, get it to the student, get them up and running. And that's part of the um, face to face hand um, held, hand holding of the field service, field technician services. OK, I just I just want to make sure that we have we should have learned, you know, over the last two years and our struggle with the online learning and what have you. And luckily, you know, there were a number of devices and we quickly got devices to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but what we've learned is, you know, devices break, especially when children are using them. So we should understand that breakage rate uh, pretty well and have a cushion of extra devices available to to meet that need very quickly. Uh, so. I'm not going to dive any further into it. Um, we have asked, uh, I've repeatedly asked for, you know, kind of like your plan uh, on overall plan because there's a tremendous amount of spending floating through IT. Um, but that's not for this meeting. Uh, but I do appreciate you joining um, and, and answering the questions uh, that that we've we've had for you so far. Um, the classroom display panels, just so yes. we're clear, because we also approved significant spending for that, right. right? So so it looks like we're taking some funding that we have and we're going to spend $3 million and just buy a bunch of them. And then the $2.6 million that was not funded by um, the, the county executive, are we going to approach that need at a further, further an outer year or, or what's yeah. going to happen there? No, so the approach that I'm taking for this particular initiative and this budget line item is um, it is important uh, because currently the assessment, what led to this request and, and, and the request for this initiative is that we're 70% um, of all of our AV equipment is outdated. Um, and then we do have a certain percentage of schools that don't have uh, the proper AV equipment. That was the impetus for this project. Um, we've also uh, communicated this um, initiative to TAPCO and to curriculum and we, we received positive feedback and as you recall a few board meetings ago mentioned we have a 12-month plan to get those 7,000 panels out into the uh, the um, 
the learning area. So uh, no, the I think pushing this out probably is not the best option. So what we're trying to do right now is figure out what items can we cut to be able to fund this. We're trying to allocate funds so that we can keep the commitment of getting the 7000 panels out within the 12 month period after we start the rollout. Thank you. Are there any other questions regarding these items before we move on? All right, uh, Ms. Causey, I see you have a quick question. Thank you. Related to the projector uh, implementation, mm -hmm. um, I've heard uh, questions <clears throat> from stakeholders that at that contract, if I recall, there were two different um, brands that were uh, being considered. There were also leasing being considered versus purchasing being considered. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was a similar situation, I won't go into it, years ago. Um, and some people expressed concern about receiving the, um, the brand that had not yet been implemented in BCPS. So uh, when is when is it going to be decided which schools are getting which brand? Are you going to go with all of one brand to start with? And there was no breakdown. Well, I don't recall what the breakdown, if any, that was provided on the cost between the two different brands that were in that same um, large contract spending authority. So mm -hmm. can you speak to that? Yeah, I can start so you can, some of it I don't know offhand, but um, the so first of all, the the funding or the request for spending authority, uh, that amount was for a six year period. Uh, so you're, you're absolutely correct. There's um, for the lease options, it was a lease over six years. Um, and also um, what we're looking at with the new panels, which the brands, the Clary uh, panels, um, the, li the expected life expectancy of those far exceeds the six years. So with a, um, a, a buyback option, we'll have um, after the six year um, period, we'll have extended life of those products. Um, so, so we're looking, uh, I will have to get you the cost comparison between the Clary panels and the other uh, was the Promethean panels. What I can tell you is that the in terms of functionality, the new panels, the Clary panels do have um, additional functionality that we have not been able to provide um, that will be in those panels. Um, I can also tell you that we will be starting the rollout um, the last week of June, I believe, um, right in that time frame, and um, we can provide the breakout of our schedule. Um, right now, the um, the intent is to, um, if need be, for schools that currently have a majority of Promethean panels, um, if it's makes sense we would repurpose some of the Promethean panels but right now we're trying to get to the point for support purposes where we have a standard model across all of our instructional um, um, rooms or instructional areas all right thank you we're gonna have to move on um, mr tantliff can you take us uh, through yeah we're all one time um, requests right? yeah i think that's where we are yeah, yep, yep. Um, Looks like they're all funded. The one times are all funded, so that was good. They were they were pretty modest. Okay. Um, then, now let's jump down to the ESSER piece, please, because this is ex interesting. Not that it's I guess not I all interesting. Mention, uh, when I did this summary, I just had a typo, and the um oh the uh. This last line item, I, I had it in 22, it's actually 23. These are the safety support contractual employees that's starting up uh, right now. So I just moved it to 23 in here. So the instructional day, this is the extra 15 minutes. Um, it's funded in ESSER in 22, 23, and 24. So this, uh, the 31, the 32, <clears throat> basically pays for the extra 15 minutes for the principals, for the teachers, 
for the paras. Um, and that's just so I'm clear. That's that's just for two years. Come 24, we're down 30, 30 plus million dollars. No, it's 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 actually just combined over here in 24 because it goes to ESSER three in 24. It's on ESSER two oh, these okay. years. So, so it's not till 25, 25 that we're gonna yeah. have yeah. the impact. Yeah, so there's two components. They also added uh, basically 131 paras to help plug in the day uh, to keep the 15 extra minutes running uh, smoothly. So this number is this component and this component combined in 24. Uh, the IEP chairs we talked about already, that's funded. Uh, this year and next year, uh, that certainly would be on the table to fund in 24. Uh, the virtual learning program, uh, it's going to continue basically in its current state next year, other than uh, my understanding is kindergartners will get dropped. So it'll just start in first grade next year. Um, 20, if they wanted to continue, certainly 24 could be on the table for that initiative. Um, if the superintendent and board wanted to continue it, um, but I don't uh, know. I don't think anyone knows what the plan will be. Uh, we'll see how next year goes. Then the 35.6 uh, counselor, social workers, nurses, etc. cetera. Uh, those are funded for the three years. And after that, we'd either have to fund it or absorb them into existing vacancies, which is, you know, quite frankly, any grant uh, the employees know the once the grant ends, they will likely be absorbed somewhere else, but they're, you know, they could lose their job too if there were no open positions. Uh, the teachers to reduce classroom size. Uh, same deal there. Those are 78 extra classroom teachers in 22 and 23. Um, you know, they hopefully wouldn't be needed going forward and if our enrollment bounces back we'll be able to fund extra teachers just through the money in our enrollment growth uh, the community eligibility provision cep for the 78 schools that are eligible didn't need to fund any it was originally planned for 22 but uh, if you recall we did not need to spend anything this year because the department of agriculture funded free meals for every child across the country that program is ending. So next year will be status quo on food service pre pandemic. Uh, so we will need 2.6 million to fill in the shortfall for food service caused by the CEP program. Uh, again, that could be funded in 24 too, if desired, um, but would become a funding cliff at some point. And then the safety program, which uh, I think you're all aware, just is starting up now for this year. Um, it'll be funded on the grant next year. And uh, I then, uh, you know, the program will be evaluated to decide if it should continue in 24 and beyond. That's it. Ms. Mack, you had a question? I do. Uh, my question is specific to the virtual learning program. Uh, Mr. Tantliff, I know that we hired people specifically for VLP, but I also know that we gave existing tenured teachers the opportunity to move into VLP. What for those 210.4 FTEs associated with VLP, if VLP goes away, do we absorb those teachers that we desperately need back into our brick and mortar classrooms, what happens to them? And did we take their their salaries and cost out of another budget category to move it into VLP? Um, so the virtual learning program is 100% funded by the ESSER grant. So it did not impact any existing budgeted positions in any way. These are 100% incremental. Um, as you mentioned, many of them were filled by existing teachers uh, where they couldn't be. They uh, hired externally, but we hire, you know, north of 700 teachers in a typical year. So it will not be any. So if the program goes away in 24, 
um, I'm confident in saying there will be no problem at all absorbing them um, into the regular pool of teachers and they would uh, place just like every teacher places. They're in VLP. They want to go to a school that has an opening. They would put in to go to that school. So it'd be the same process that we have now for them to figure out which school they'd be placed in. Now, if they were in a school they really liked, they might not be able to go back to that school because that school might not have any openings now. Right. My other question is, you said, um, and and they know that they, when the grant money goes away, so might the positions. Did I hear you say that correctly? Well, any fixed term grant, when the employees go on to the grant, they know that the grant is only, you know, if the grant is known for a fixed amount of time, like that wouldn't apply to Title I because we know Title I and IDA, the special ed grant, keep getting renewed uh, every year. So people wouldn't be thinking of it that way. But anytime you have a fixed time period grant, any employee going on that grant knows that the grant may go away. But any typical position, um, I don't know of any issues we've ever had. I, I can't say ever. I'm not aware of any recent positions where the person had any problem um, going off the grant back into uh, you know, a regular school or whatever their position was qualified for. And then finally, I know these are unprecedented times with the amount of federal money that's available, but in the history since you've been with BCPS, have we ever been in a position where regardless of the source of the funding where we created and faced possible cliffs and what did we do about it? Um, I, I can't uh, answer that off the top of my head because it would probably be history that uh, predates me. So I can't um, answer that. Um, I'm guessing though, back um, if you remember when President Obama during the 08 recession, uh, they put a lot of stimulus money in the school that was fairly unrestricted. So uh, school districts did have a cliff depending on how they spent that money that they needed to fill in the next year through planning. So uh, either that your county could fill it in or uh, you know you might need to come up with uh, another solution, but I don't think we've ended up having a dramatic situation where people didn't have a home. Okay, um, again, thank you for all of this and thank you for answering my questions. Sure, of course. Thank you, Mr. Tantliff. I, I do have a few questions I just wanted to, to see if we could field um, the virtual learning program. Um, you know, that was developed as in response to the pandemic and health concerns. Um, since we are, um, you know, this is funded right through this year and it looks like we have funding through next year through this grant. Um, so it looks as if our two choices going forward are to continue to fund it somehow or to re, you know, remove the program and, and the option. I mean, we've always had some level of a virtual learning program. It was much, much smaller. And I don't I don't think we called it VLP. There's another name for Probably it. Hospital. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't have the scope and the volume and the magnitude that this program has. So with that being the case, um, the expectation would be that the children that or the students that are currently in that program would just go back to their districted schools. Is that is that is there discussion of that at any level um, uh -huh. or is that out, you know, in 24 and we're not worrying about it, planning about it until, you know, the um, next the next year? Honestly, I think someone like Dr. Boswell McComas would be the best person because she's kind of the owner of the program so okay. she would be the best person to address those types of conversations and and just to you know hit the key points here right as of fy you know going from 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 what we're looking at here we're going from seventy two thousand dollars in ESSER funds to 37 in 24 right so we're losing you know 
30 plus. No, no, I just, I just want to clarify, right? Mr. Kuhn. Yeah. What I picked on here are in the current budget things that you might look at like a cliff. I th This is not the entire budget. No, I understand. I'm, I'm just making the point that, and I appreciate you outlining and pulling these items down for us so that we can and focus on them because they're, in essence, the funding ends after 24 totally, um, current, you know, because ESSER ends. Yeah. Everyone needs to understand ESSER ends, and that's why we're having this conversation. And the the I'm just talking about the incremental change from 23 to 24. We're looking at a $30 million deficit there that either has to be picked up by the county and state, um, our funding partners, or we start doing without and reducing spending. Is that, that's your understanding also? Well, your other, your third option would be to fund it for one more year in the ESSER grant based on underspending and other programs. So uh, the superintendent could at some point generate another amendment to the grant um, and there may be enough money to fund some or all of these items. So can you explain how that would actually work? I thought that ESSER was a limited amount of funding. You're just saying move it around within? Yeah, so we, we've had underspent. Itself. We've had underspending on some of the initial initiatives. Um, and so the total amount doesn't change, but if we don't spend the money this year, we can put in an amendment to move it to future years of the grant. Now it all has to be spent by the time the grant ends, but we've had um, some initiatives. You know, we've had trouble hiring people, as you know, uh, the special ed compensatory services program um, did not uh, spend near Early as much as was originally planned. Uh, there's just, there's other items we didn't need to do once, you know, because we had to do it early. We had to get the application in. There were lots of unknowns. So um, I believe there's money available that, again, it could be used for these items. It could be used for something else once that all gets flushed out. Fair Mr. enough. Mr. Keen, Mr. Yes. Keen this is uh, Mr. Hartlove. Um, but, and I, I think you, you raise a really good point, and it's something that we've been thinking about internally in fiscal services, and I've had discussions with um, uh, Dr. Williams about. It's a, it's an incredibly in, a valid point that these dollars are going to go away, and we have some things that are built in that are, you know, uh, could uh, raise some concerns. Um, there's a few things that we're looking at. You know, you can look at various things on this list that one may may go away because they were specifically in response to the the pandemic the vlp for instance potentially i'm not saying it is but potentially that's a discussion point the 149 uh, para for support and safety we're hopeful that we'll return to normalcy at some point when we get into a, a, po a post pandemic uh, air, uh time and maybe that will be able, we'll be able to limit that Certainly, we've uh, we've advocated to the uh, uh, the county executive for the uh, the 15 minutes continuing that on. So that would be so. Some of these items may go away. Some may uh, we may get additional funding from the county. And then the last thing that I, I would say is that we're very fortunate that at, at the same time this will be kind of ramping down. The blueprint funding will be ramping up, so some of this we're hopeful that uh, some of this can be absorbed in the additional funding that we're getting through the blueprint. So that, that that's kind of the, it's going to be a combination of additional county funding requests, some things going away, and then some things being absorbed into uh, the blueprint. That would be kind of my take on how we're going to uh, uh, deal with the cliff. I appreciate uh, your input. One of the questions. Um, and and I know it's not on this, but we've talked about the ESSER funding before for the special ed uh, compensatory services. And I recall it being a very significant line item. And in our discussion, it sounded as if it was not being utilized. Do we have an update on that? And because I'm guessing that we're going to see some kind of, uh, is that is that money? in fiscal year 22 or 23 and 24. I don't know how far it goes. I'm I'm curious because I recall it being a large sum. It, it was. It was about 30 million a year in originally in 22 and 23, 
but 22 has been pretty drastically underspent. So there's already been one um, amendment that impacted ESSER and moves and reallocated some of that money. Um, but I think special ed is waiting till this year is over to really give a good prediction for next year. But that was just for makeup services. So I think the demand hasn't been as high and they have not been able to get the resources to provide the demand. So I think it was, and maybe they forecast it too high to begin with. Um, so there's a combination of things that's preventing them from spending the majority of that as originally planned. Okay, Ms. Mack, you had a comment? I do, um, and it's just a general comment. I I hear the discussion that we may not need certain positions um, and, and I understand that it was about the contractual student support safety assistance, but I, I would just like to say as we have discussions about people, we always talk about how important having people in the schools and the classrooms are. And I don't know that we should be too quick to get rid of anybody. Maybe we can repurpose people, but we talk about kids needing people and I would like to see us fight to keep as many bodies in schools that we can. Thank you. And and, and I'm and this is Mr. Hartlove again. Um, I I I was using those as examples, and I and I as I was saying it, I I'm I'm our logic on those uh, on those positions is that a lot of the behavioral issues that we're having are are kind of connected to the pandemic, and then eventually we'll get back to something uh, uh, more normal. Um, that's a you know that's a theory, uh, and, and if that doesn't work in practice, then you're you're 100 right. We're not gonna, we don't want to pull things out that are being utilized and needed and necessary. Um, so I use that as an example. It may have been a bad example um, because we're, we're we haven't even implemented the program, and I'm talking about taking them out. So that's, no, no, I understand yeah. that. I guess what yeah. I'm saying is, you know, let's let's hope that we get back to where we don't need them in the role for which they're hired but maybe they can be utilized in a school in a different role that helps students or, um, you know, just in any in any role. I just think we need more people in the schools is what I'm saying. And I and I agree. I agree with that wholeheartedly. And and there's there's also another important point. Mr. Tantliff made this earlier, but I just repeat it. You know, there's the positions when we talk about positions potentially going away and then there's people. Uh, you know, I think we are a big enough system and through the amount of you know, turnover that we typically have, most of these, I think the goal would be all these folks would land back in into other positions. So, you know, it wouldn't be hardship for people. And these are, you know, these are good, good employees for us that we want to keep. So if we do have to, uh, and the goal would not be, would be to not have to uh, uh, reduce positions, but if we ever had to do that, they would be absorbed into into through attrition into other positions that are that are not going away. Thank you very much. All right. Well, look, this has been a great conversation. I truly um, um, appreciate it, and we're running out of time. But I see Ms. Gauzy has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Um, I again just really appreciate the presentation and um, the discussion um, and discussion of my colleagues um, on the board as well as staff. Um, I also just wanted to uh, support Ms. Mack's statements about uh, the people being so vital to our students' success and that families, communities, the school system and on are still in recovery from the pandemic. So I'm also hopeful that some staff that we may need next year, um, like that additional uh, safety or social emotional supports, as everyone recovers and heals and rebuilds, uh, that some of those positions will be less needed or or not needed and, and then could be uh, repurposed as Ms. Max said. So um, I'm hopeful that you know things continue to improve and we're just trying to get the best information uh, so that as board members, uh, we can make the best decisions that we can and support the um, efforts of the school system and 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 just look forward to things improving. So thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, um, moving on. The next item is just information, and it's there just to remind us that um, the corrective action plan for the OIGE case um, is still something that this committee has to deal with. I know we took action on it in a previous meeting, so we're going to move on. Um, the next item is announcements and adjournment. Uh, so the last item on the agenda is about the budget committee meeting that is scheduled for Wednesday, June 22nd at 5.30 p.m. I'm just going to give everyone's a, head, a heads up. That may change. Mr. Tantliff is deciding to go on vacation and out of the country. So um, he will not be available at that point in time. Uh, so we're trying to determine, one, what our agenda will be, and, and two, if we need to move it earlier in the month so that we have access to Mr. Tantliff since he is um, on point with the budget uh, every every step of the way. Uh, so um, I just mentioned that for everyone to understand. Um, is there any further business? I just Mr. like to know where Mr. Tantliff is going. Portugal. Oh, good for you. Congratulations. That sounds pretty fantastic. Outstanding. All right. Well, on that note, Mr. Kuhn, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, I just had one quick comment um, or a request for the June meeting agenda. Um, if we could discuss um, zero based budgeting as we uh, begin the budget process for next year um, with Mr. Hartlove, since he's joined us since the last discussion. Um, that is a, a concept or an idea that has been um, discussed in this committee previously, and I would like to revisit it. Well, we'll consider that as I set the agenda. Thank you for the insight. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for your time. The meeting is now adjourned. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Good meeting. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks all. Good night.